Good morning, everybody. My name is Oliver Schmidtke. I'm director of the Center for Global Studies and I have the great pleasure introducing this session on the one-year account of the COVID-19 pandemic. And before we start off, let me acknowledge with respect uh, the Likwangan peoples on whose traditional and unceded territory the university stands and the Songhees and Esquimalt and the Saanich peoples whose historical relationship with the land continue to this day. And uh, this is something that we you know, take very seriously here at the center, having the privilege of being on the territory of the Likwangan, the legacy of their them living here and you know with respect to what we're going to hear about the pandemic also the vulnerability that come with the legacy of uh, the being unseated on their traditional territory. With this I would like to introduce our session for today and you know the moderator and I'm very happy that Nathan Lachowski took over this role and Nate is um, an associate professor in the School of Public Health and Social Policy, and he's also taken on the role recently as the special advisor for health research in the Office of the Vice President uh, Research and Innovation here at UVic. So, yeah, uh, Nathan is very much a, a, an institution builder and someone very passionate about health related issues, also from a particular community um, perspective, thinking about community based approaches to addressing health challenges. So a very good position to be in reflecting on where we are at one year in into the pandemic. So Nate, thank you very much for taking this over. Ta thank you for your leadership, both for the Global Health Discussion Group that we have um, here at the center, but also more broadly, uh, trying to promote health research at the University of Victoria. And with this, let me turn it over to Nate uh, and uh, have him introduce our distinguished panel for today. Great, Oliver, thank you for that. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to fulfill this role. I think it's one of the um, more fun roles to get to listen and ask questions and uh, stimulate the conversation today. So um, thanks everyone also for taking the time to join at this busy time of year. Um, and uh, what feels like a remarkable one year mark um, in many ways, it's hard to believe a whole year has passed. And in many ways, it's hard to believe only a full year has passed as well. Um, we have three um, amazing folks who are here to speak with us today. Um, I'll briefly each introduce each of them. So Dr. Mitchell Hammond is an assistant professor in UVic's history department. Um, he's researched histor the history of disease and healthcare um, with an archival focus on civic health regimes in German cities during the 16th century. Um, most recently, he authored the book Epidemics in the Modern World, which was published just last year by University of Toronto Press. And a Chinese translation of the book um, is due out in October this year. Um, Dr. Robert Hewish is an associate professor in international development studies at Dalhousie, Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. His research covers a wide range of topics, including global health, social justice, and the consequences of sanctions and embargoes. His global health work focuses on South-South cooperation, solidarity, and global health equity. And his current work explores how COVID-19 ordinances produce stigma and the consequences of that. He's authored uh, Going Where No Doctor Has Gone Before, Cuba's Place in the Global Health Landscape, and a number of articles on global health and social justice. He teaches several classes and was named uh, Canada's most innovative educator in Globe and Mail's Our Time to Lead series. Um, one of the classes he teaches is Pandemic, the class, which is a real-time virtual simulation of pandemic management and response. And he also hosts the podcast GDP, the Global Development Primer. And last but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Jifa Dordanu is an assistant professor in the School of Nursing here at UVic and a member of the Global Health Research Discussion Group, one of the many discussion groups here at the Center for Global Studies, and is a native of Zodzi, Ghana. She has over 19 years of varied clinical practice, working in general medicine and coronary care units, as well as outpatient clinics, and has extensive experience working on investigator-initiated and industry-sponsored clinical trials at the John Hopkins University. Her program of research leverages dissemination and implementation science to address factors that influence quality of care and patient outcomes. And working in interdisciplinary teams, uh, Jifa has published several articles in peer-reviewed journal articles. She teaches at the undergraduate and graduate level. Uh, she holds a bachelor's, of degree, a bachelor's degree with distinction from UVic, a master's degree from Duke University, with post-master's certificates in clinical research management and teaching, and completed her doctoral education at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, with a focus on heart failure, um, and is currently completing postgraduate certificate as a nurse practitioner. Clearly, a great love of learning. And that's why we're all here today, is to learn a little bit from these excellent folks and the great work that they're doing. Um, so thank you to the Global Studies, uh, Center for Global Studies, for putting this together. 
So that's our panel. And at this point, I'm going to hand it over to our first panelist, Mitchell, um, to talk uh, with us all. Thank you, Nathan. And uh, hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here with you today. I'd like to consider briefly how our diverse experiences with COVID in the past year relate to the broader past and present of pandemics. I'm mindful that the COVID crisis is not behind us. So my thoughts are more along the lines of challenges that we face rather than lessons that we've learned. I think one thing we've all been shown is that pandemic diseases are part of what it means to live in a modern world. They're with us in ways that people once assumed that the world was leaving behind. In 1972, two prominent scientists, including a Nobel Prize winning virologist, Frank McFarlane Burnett, predicted, as they put it, that the most likely forecast about the future of infectious disease is that it will be very dull. That may seem surprising, but uh, it's not hard to see why they wrote that. Um, in the previous 25 years, vaccination had eliminated polio from North America and Europe. Penicillin had transformed the treatment of bacterial infections and inroads had been made on the path to eradicate smallpox. So lots of scientists hoped that soon infectious diseases would no longer affect social life very much. Now, of course, this optimism appears very distant. The emergence of HIV in the early 1980s and resurgences of malaria and tuberculosis forced scientists to rethink and even to do a turnabout. In 1992, a committee of U.S. researchers issued a report uh, on what they called emerging infections, warning that many new diseases would likely emerge. And they warned that many of these new diseases would be zoonotic infections caused by pathogens that jumped from other animals to humans when boundaries or relationships between them were disrupted. And we've seen this come to pass since then with the resurgence of Ebola virus disease, the increased severity of Zika virus disease, the small outbreaks stemming from avian influenza and the emergence of SARS in 2003 and SARS-CoV-2 or coronavirus disease in 2019. These examples show us that pandemics are not a relic of a distant past when humans were powerless against all sorts of plagues. Pandemics are a characteristic attribute of the way we live now we have them because we are connected globally and because humans intervene in the natural world on a scale never experienced before. We face another challenge with how our rapidly evolved medical and media technologies have shaped our view of pandemics. Through most of human history, disease outbreaks were mostly experienced locally or as communal threats. And all sorts of chronicles and histories uh, have been written about uh, bubonic plague in London or Marseille or uh, cholera in Paris, for example. And underlying these stories is a, a basic narrative arc. Disease descends on a community from outside. It wreaks havoc as experts and lay people fight it. And then it recedes leaving a period of sober reckoning. And this kind of narrative for many people over time could put epidemic events in a meaningful frame. And past historians have used this narrative and even reinforced it because epidemics served as a kind of laboratory to understand social tensions and pressures. But our experience of COVID's global spread upends this thinking. Our media brings us news from around the world, often in real time. Vincent Manzerol has used the term technologies of immediacy to refer to tools that enable real-time engagement and collapse physical distance. And that technology for us right now is the COVID dashboard, which represents cases, deaths, and vaccinations in numbers and graphs. The actual figures vary over time and region, but the information is presented as interchangeable, whether it's gathered across the province or around the world. When we add to this the actual capacity for COVID to move across boundaries, to recur, and to evolve, it becomes difficult to envision arriving at a point where we will look back and learn from something that is over. And it can make it more difficult for us to discern what is particular about our community's COVID experience, challenges, and needs. To cite just one example, in 2020, more people died in British Columbia from opioid overdose related uh, conditions 
than from COVID-related conditions. What this means and how COVID and opioid, opioid use might be related are important topics among lots of other important topics that aren't captured on a dashboard, even when such problems are recognized as important. This is related to a third challenge, familiar both in history and in current discourse. Like other pandemics, COVID has exposed and aggravated inequalities and divisions within and across societies. This has been true for centuries, for Jews who were targeted during the Black Death of the 14th century or among lower class workers who rioted in European cities during cholera outbreaks after 1830. In some respects, COVID has influenced societies in a fashion similar to the influenza pandemic of 1918-19. That disease also traversed the globe and struck lower class urban communities and indigenous communities particularly hard, especially in Canada's far north and in Pacific Islands. But one marked contrast is that flu in 1918-19 disproportionately struck young adults between the ages of about 20 and 35, while COVID has caused the highest rates of illness and mortality among people of advanced years. And this was a point recently made by Chief Public Health Officer Teresa Tam, who noted that even in a second COVID wave, seniors in care homes were not adequately protected. The tragic COVID experience may help Canadians to address pre-existing needs for a group of people who are often segregated and vulnerable, as well as the circumstances of racialized minorities and indigenous communities, who often have relatively lower incomes and poorer access to healthcare. All of these challenges will remain for whatever COVID has in store for us and into the more distant future. We can hope that our experience will lead to some consensus on what the key problems are and deepen our resolve to meet them. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Mitchell, for that. And all, always a pleasure when folks have a few spare minutes at the end as well. So that'll leave us even more time for questions. Thank you. Okay, Robert, uh, next to you. So yeah, hi folks. So thanks, uh, thanks for uh, for offering me to, the chance to talk to you today. Um, it's been a uh, it's been an incredible year, um, no doubt for for everybody. And on a personal note, but this time last year, I was actually hightailing it out of UVic to uh, to come back to the uh, to eventually get into the Atlantic bubble before I knew there would be an Atlantic bubble. And also I was in the US just before that and, and came back up. So I, I literally left UVic so quickly uh, last year that I, I still have your keys, uh, which I need to get back to you. Uh, but it's been a very transitional year in 2020, 2021 uh, with the pandemic and uh, the change in leadership in the US has certainly been a big part of it. One of the projects that I've started in the last, uh, last year is actually looking at the impact of stigma uh, that, has, that has evolved and has occurred in different ways uh, through the pandemic. Uh, the research grant that I have right now through the Nova Scotia Health Coalition for COVID-19 Research just looks at Atlantic Canada, but we do have partners in Australia and New Zealand who uh, have been able to work with us on this and share some findings as well. So I just want to run through some highlights of, of what's gone on there. But really, this, this does start uh, in terms of how stigma is positioned during the pandemic from, from the former president to, to the current one, to, in terms of how these discourses have changed. Uh, Nature, uh, scientific magazine, uh, rarely weighs in on politics, but in fact, uh, made the case that, uh, you know, Trump himself as leader uh, in the United States actually has had a massive impact uh, on, on just how much advantage was given to the virus during the pandemic. Uh, rare for a, a scientific publication like that to make such commentary, but there you have it. And in many ways, in terms of what the science is about uh, the suspicion around vaccines or about uh, shirking uh, public health measures and, and social distancing practices, that's one thing. I'm really concerned about social science impacts. And uh, there's, Trump was, uh, was a character who certainly led his politics be very clearly known and uh, to the point where he'd actually overwrite uh, his own speeches. So as this was exposed by a, a Reuters uh, reporter where he was making a speech about the coronavirus, actually took a Sharpie, uh, scratched out corona on the, on the podium and wrote Chinese uh, on top of it to, uh, to create a racial denomination to that. Uh, we've seen around the world uh, increase uh, violent attacks and uh, 
uh, racial hate crimes against people who appear to be of Asian descent around the world, including Vancouver. Uh, the police forces in Vancouver uh, report that racialized hate crimes have been up 860% uh, since the pandemic. Some very violent incidents have been shared on media through CCTV camera. Uh, ditto for that of New Zealand. New Zealand's Human Rights Commission on COVID-19 uh, racism has reported some 300% increase in complaints coming into that country. We've been hearing so much about how New Zealand has done well during the pandemic, but yet uh, the Human Rights Office has been flooded, uh, and ditto for Australia, where even uh, at the university level, we're hearing uh, very serious accusations and issues of, of racism going on there. Now, just as Mitchell said, when you're dealing with pandemics, uh, these aren't new things. These are these are old. Like, these are biblically old, like Book of Leviticus old, like it's back there. And if you think about the public health measures that are recommended, staying at home, safe social distancing, uh, basically everything on there except 811 uh, dates back to medieval of pre-medieval times in terms of how you deal with pandemics. And uh, as we see here uh, in, in biblical times, you know, saying that as long as they have the disease, quote, they remain unclean, they must live alone, they must live outside the camp. And, and again, coming from the Old Testament, there we also see traces of stigmatization against the othering of people through through the virus. In the medieval times, the 14th century, uh, you know, a, a period when the Black Death was just ravaging Europe to the point where there was even a wool shortage because of all the, the sheep that were being killed because of, of the suspicion of transmitting viruses through, uh, through the sheep and, and pigs and goats. Uh, there was uh, exactly that, that uh, very unsophisticated techniques uh, that physicians were using at the time, but uh, people could do what they could to avoid uh, getting sick. They would escape urban areas, they would go to rural areas, they would isolate. Uh, and then in 1665, in the British town of uh, AM, uh, where it was decided that they would all lock in and sort of self-isolate away from Britain, uh, it fortunately did not go very well at all, where within 14 months, uh, plague there killed 260 villagers uh, with only 83 surviving out of 350 because they didn't understand about how the virus was moving on on vermin at the time. Fast forward to modern days and we see things like this here in the New York subway system where a man who appears to be of Asian descent is being febrized by a fellow passenger on the on the transit and no one else is really coming to it. National Geographic did a very riveting photo study of what was going on in in New York City with uh, with Asian Americans uh, there and these these brigades that would literally go through Chinatown in uh, lower Manhattan uh, to protect people who are going out for uh, walks or to go to restaurants to be there in groups uh, again National Geographic great photographers and what the camera shows and what the camera doesn't hide as you see here, a uh, fellow here, this is uh, Carlin Chan, uh, who heard rumors about Chinatown residents being harassed. So we formed these brigades to go out. And sure enough, guys just walking through a, a open air restaurant before the closing, and he is getting ugly stares, and he is getting more ugly stares, right? So this sort of stigmatization has really been prominent uh, for people who appear to be of Asian descent around the world. Uh, even today in Atlanta, there's been a, quite a horrendous crime that's taken place in that city uh, that it's led to the loss of life by a 21-year-old uh, white sh shooter uh, there. Uh, it's something that the World Health Organization and the Center for Diseases Control uh, knew was coming. They, they knew this was going to be part of the package. Uh, so they had all these protocols to reduce stigma, to try to to, to try to reduce it. But the thing is, you can put as many websites up as you want. And if you've got political leadership that encourages hatred of others, uh, people will follow that and they will find a way to hurt. And that is the real challenge, is that there are, there are cases that it's obvious where this is occurring, but how has stigma played out in other ways and places that appear to be doing well or have a sense of community spirit or strong community ties, has stigma played out there? And the short answer to that is, is yes, yes it has. Um, we've seen here in the Atlantic bubble, we've had very, very low rates of COVID-19 during the entire pandemic, uh, months upon months where there's only one or two cases a day. Uh, so there were two upticks that took place, uh, mostly through seniors' homes uh, within New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. But why? Um, why were the rates so low? What's gone on here in Atlantic Canada that has had COVID rates that are comparable to isolated nations 
in the South Pacific. Uh, there, there's something about this. And part of it was this imagination about the bubble. So how do bubbles work and why? Well, is it because you're living in a bubble? Well, no, the airport was still open. Uh, essential workers are still coming and going and the border with New Brunswick is, is laughably porous. Um, yet some provinces like PEI and New Brunswick, they made it clear that it was about keeping out the virus. Public health officials at the beginning said we want to keep the virus out. Uh, as we know from public health strategies that you can't just put up enough walls or close bridges uh, against viruses. They will find a way. You might slow them down, but that's not how you prevent them. And uh, Nova Scotia did this in time, uh, but it also changed its tune. After about two or three months of the Atlantic bubble, uh, discourse public health and on social media also changed from appearing to be suspicious of people who weren't from Atlantic Canada to people who may not be following the rules. And that changed. And here are some of the groups that were, that were targeted uh, in, in order from, from this. So again, we saw that uh, you know, this sort of act of violence here in New York City, I believe there was, yes, I found it, there was the, the truck in Victoria that, that got tagged, uh, where the guy had Texas plates and someone out and, 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 and ruined the guy's truck because he felt he was from away. Uh, and here in uh, Nova Scotia, this is Benjamin Hebb's car. He got go home put on it. Other people have had their windows smashed, tires played with, uh, lots of car keying and parking lots, a few altercations in parking lots as well. Dude's driving a, a Honda, a, a Honda, a nice, a nice little Honda there. And it's got, um, sorry, back up there. It's got uh, New York plates on the front. Well, in Nova Scotia, we don't have to have front plates on our cars. Uh, so the guy's just a Ghostbusters enthusiast. So he put Ecto-1 on the front. Someone saw that and started harassing his car. Like, dude, dude just likes Ghostbusters. Is probably washing his hands and following rules. No problem. But when the, the bubble burst, uh, what eventually came about, what we can learn about in the last minute, I'll just share with you, uh, is that we've seen that where there were different groups within the bubble that were targeted uh, over time. People who are reporting that they felt uh, isolated, they've had uh, harassing or violent behavior. It started with people who appeared to be of Asian descent. It then moved on to people who had out of province license plates. It then moved on to uh, students who were returning for the fall semester. Uh, when the premier uh, sort of called them out on that. And then more recently, there's now a new rising tension uh, with people who have got access to the vaccine and who do not. So it shows that the efficacy is really about following the rules within a bubble, but also trying to take care of people at that same time. Uh, if you have too much surveillance, it's going to backfire and people are not going to be uh, reporting to contact tracers. They're going to try to hide. Uh, we've got serious questions, um, you know, coming out about this as well and other things about adaptation of policy. I mean quarantines are about preventing some people from getting the virus, they're about putting other people at risk. Uh, here in Nova Scotia, uh, medical first responders, firefighters are, uh, if they respond to a heart attack call, they are currently prohibited from giving oxygen if administering CPR. So if you know about CPR, you know it has a low rate of success to begin with, but if you take the oxygen out of the equation, it has almost a no rate success. Uh, so that's a risk that, uh, that's that been put in part of this. But uh, again, quarantines are designed to protect some, not protect others. And as an old social consequence of using old methods like this, uh, we're starting to see stigma be part of that equation. And it's something that we'll, we'll see for a long time having impacts here in, in, uh, in the Atlantic, uh, where you've also got healthcare workers and truck drivers and rural Nova Scotia, rural New Brunswick, who are really proud of being active members of their community. And as our research showed that now they feel like they can barely go out and even talk to their neighbors. And that will probably be a long lingering impact in this region. So thanks a lot for uh, hearing that and uh, putting up with my slides. Thanks, Robert. Okay, Anjifa, over to you. All right, so I suppose this is a good segue, Robert, into my discussion around scientific racism and COVID-19. Just a, a quick disclaimer that anything I say here is reflective of me and not anybody or anything that uh, I am affiliated with. So I want to uh, begin our conversation in talking about what is scientific um, racism. And this is not something new, as Mitchell has alluded to. Um, some of these have uh, very deep historical uh, roots. So the idea of scientific racism is that the physical attributes that we have, that is, for example, my skin color, your skin color, our eye color, our hair texture, 
those things form the foundation of what they call races or the human races. And so in that, in constructing that ideology, uh, white skin had been sort of portrayed as being more advanced and more superior than blacks over time. This ideology was uh, uh, what was used to support the slavery, the transatlantic uh, slavery. Um, but over time, scientists have um, found more modern ways of uh, trying to look at how we are related or not to, to one another with the mapping of the genomes in the early 2000s, basically revealing that there's only one human race and that the geographic uh, delineations that we have created over time are actually meaningless, genetically speaking. So um, this here was a, um, uh, a publication from um, um, a couple of folks from, um, um, sorry, anthropology, sorry, physical anthropology, I couldn't get the right words, where they basically were highlighting that, you know, over the years, we as scientists, scientific community have been a little bit complacent and not being um, vigilant about how race is, uh, how race is represented in research. So uh, often we use it, which is you know, we've all realized it is a social construct, but you, we use it as a meaning or to highlight biological uh, reasons for people's behaviors, for health outcomes. And the evidence over and over again uh, have shown that that is not mean, meaningful, um, but you would think that that practice would stop. And the truth is it has not stopped. And I just wanted to actually put the uh, actual statement from the uh, Association of um, Physical Anthropology, which they basically said that while race does not represent patterns of human biodiversity, uh, there is the race is real in terms of racism. And that is the prejudice that people feel um, and experience uh, whether it is in their workplace, in their communities, and what have you not, does have real health consequences. So we would think that, you know, knowing that knowledge, that that would change the way we practice. I'm a nurse by training, uh, practice nursing or medicine, and the truth is it has not. So for right now in medicine, you will find that when they're calculating the um, function, the renal function, kidney function, that the um, equations actually factor in the skin color. Again, the literature shows that the skin color correlation to any sort of biological processes is meaningless, but it does, um, it does still show up in that regard. Uh, and the other um, ways is when associations are um, sort of, uh, so this one is taken from the Canadian Diabetes Association where they're talking about the risk factors and it's saying that people's ethnic background, being African, Arab, Asian, that those things may actually influence type two diabetes. When we know that the um, pathogenesis of type two diabetes is polygenic and that there's multiple factors and not even genes, the genes that have been uh, um, discovered to influence this are not actually um, nicely divided or separated by geographic or ethnic backgrounds. But you see that. And more, um, more recently, not recently, but it's still ongoing where you see the word uh, of, for example, black ethnicity being predictive of, again, biological processes. And often when you find, when you do these, when you read these things is that the researchers do not explain beyond just, you know, black people are more likely for, you know, to have stent thrombosis, but do, do not explain why or how that mechanism comes through. And so it is my belief in uh, others that, you know, that silence actually leads to uh, supporting implicit biases that we all have about people and that in fact can uh, aggravate stigma um, against these communities.
So, you know, swing back to COVID-19, how has this sort of played out? Um, in some ways, I believe that, uh, at least in my opinion, that um, what COVID-19 has done is it, it opened the door wide open to this idea of scientific racism. If we didn't know it before, hopefully we do now. And as Robert has already alluded to, uh, the uh, US president calling the, the disease one thing when clearly um, we know the motivations of what he was trying to do. But as we were also hearing about what the president, the US president was doing, there were also um, reports of Africans in China and Africans are such a huge, it's a continent, but people of African descent in China that were facing discrimination um, because of the virus that was going. So the notion of the scientific racism is we put things out there and not only does it um, uh, lead to discri discrimination and stigma, the most, oh, before I get there, sorry, this here again, talking about how some African-Americans have, have more devastating effects of COVID-19, but again, it doesn't speak to why is this. This is nothing uh, directly uh, related to their uh, position, social positioning as an African-American, but rather because of the contextual uh, situations that they live on. But when you read that, you don't get that impression. But what I was going to say is that, you know, this notion of scientific racism is not just leading to discrimination and health, uh, health disparities and all. It can actually be dangerous when people in themselves start believing that for some reason they are different. Different in a good way or different in a bad way. And COVID-19 uh, sort of highlighted that a little where uh, initially there were this notion of that if you are of African descent that you are actually um, somehow immune to the virus. Uh, this was stuff that was circulating and um, clearly it was a dangerous a dangerous precedence. And so I will say that, you know, uh, COVID-19 has shown that yes, social determinants of health do matter and they are the uh, underpinning a lot of the health disparities that we see. But even beyond that, I would say the racism, which has actually underpinned all of these social determinants of health uh, is one of the root causes that we need to actually start um, tackling. And we often think of racism as being sort of a hierarchical, um, um, hierarchical where you know we have white people at the top and black people in the in the bottom and every everybody in between. I like to say that I think with COVID nineteen we're realizing that this is not so much of a hierarchical organization, but rather a continuum that there are clustering around on this continuum, and that you know uh, over time. Um, uh, the gap that we're seeing between a uh, population, racially, a racially divided population, is not going to be so clearly, uh, clearly um, separated that um, over time, the disparities that we see in the Black communities, that we see in Indigenous communities, will, in fact, at least um, spread if we don't uh, begin to tackle the root causes of some of these issues that we are uh, facing. So on that, I will say that, you know, there's one thing that hopefully we've learned is that our race is not pathological and the, the racism, but rather racism is pathological. That is something that is making us sick. My skin color doesn't make me more likely to get COVID. It's if I'm not able to self-isolate if I'm not able to, um, you know, protect myself adequately, those are the things that are driving driving the cases of um, of COVID inf uh, infections, along along with other, excuse me, along with other disparities that we uh, are seeing. So I will stop there. Thank you, Jason. and thank you. All right, uh, little round of virtual applause for all of our presenters. Um, Next, we'll start with just a few questions that, I, um, that I'll post to each of the presenters respectively. Um, and during this time, um, you can also um, collect yourself and any questions that you have. 
and um, share those in the chat feature and the center staff will um, filter those. And once uh, we're done this kind of first round of questions for myself, um, then we will go on to questions from the audience. So, um, Mitchell, I, thank you very much for the historical context. I, um, I had a, a medieval historian as one of my mentors in my undergraduate uh, science degree. And I, it always reminds me of the importance of history in all of the work that we do. And, and sadly, how often we repeat the same lessons from before. Um, one of the things that during I, from my training in epidemiology, we often talk about June smallpox as being one of the only diseases we've actually eradicated um, during, as, a, as a species. Um, yet we think a lot about, um, I think this kind of like post-infectious disease and moving on to chronic health and things like that. Maybe perhaps this recent era of, um, of global infectious pandemics. So I'm curious a little bit in terms of the role of vaccines in that. Um, and when we're in this era now where we have several different vaccines available, rollout is happening doing quite differently across different regions and countries and jurisdictions. Um, I'm curious a little bit uh, if you might want to just reflect on um, what obligations do, do we have to each other, um, both as uh, nations, in terms of our inter-nation connections, um, but also in terms of during, um, yeah, our, ourselves as, um, as a human species. Yeah, well, I, I guess to, to just uh, think about vaccinations for a second, and this is... Uh, Turning, in, turning out to be a really confusing area that we're <laughs> learning about all the time in ways that you folks know more about than I do. Um, but it, it is interesting to consider, you know, if we, if we think about our, you know, what our, what our community is, and if we think in terms of, because COVID is, uh, affects everybody around the world, we can think about that in terms of what are our obligations to our, to, to uh, Canada, for example, do we have uh, vaccines and do we sort of protect uh, and even stockpile in Canada's case uh, vaccines? Or do we, or do we understand that, um, that globally, uh, you know, it's to everyone's advantage ultimately to, to make sure that as much, as much as possible can be done globally because where, wherever uh, coronavirus lurks in our globalized world, you know, it can, it can come back um, or in, mutate and so on. So, so there's, um, it's a bit of a short-term, long-term dilemma, uh, but just also thinking about community in, in different frames of reference. And I think that's very challenging when our world gets ever more interconnected. It's just interesting, just, I'll just say very briefly to compare how Canada's uh, working with this as opposed to what happened in the 1950s when Canada was, uh, was a world leader in, um, in exporting the, uh, the first successful vac uh, vaccines for polio. In the 1950s, 1955, Canada successfully sort of implemented a campaign for the SOC uh, first uh, polio vaccine. Canada was able to, um, Canada did this in some respects, you know, extremely well, whereas in the United States, they had a um, that they had a problem with some batches that were uh, improperly active, uh, inactivated. And so there was a, an incident where some people were infected with polio and a few people even died. And so this put Canada in a position of being, being the ones for a while who were able to say with confidence, uh, more so than the Americans, that the SOC vaccine actually worked. And thereafter, millions of doses of vaccine went out from Canada to the rest of the world. So, so there is, you know, fairly recent precedent for Canada uh, behaving that way, and uh, whether we whether we consider it uh, in terms of, you know, uh, a moral obligation, the right thing to do, or simply as enlightened self interest, um, we can consider, how, you know, how how we position ourselves with respect to vaccines and, and giving them uh, and making them available to to or to peoples around the world. Yeah, thanks, Angel, and I, I don't want to. Um... I'm not sure exactly how far your historical knowledge goes around vaccine administration, but in the polio example, I think June, this is a great example of a very simple vaccine, June orally administered once, um, during, and yet we have not been able to eradicate that globally, um, despite in, in extreme contributions from governments, from um, during Rotary Foundations. Um, right. And so I'm curious a little bit around, um, during there is a huge amount of global cooperation that, is, that has during really reduced polio at a global level. It's only in a few separate countries now. Um, but some of those factors that have, I'm wondering, I guess, if you want to comment, if you know a little bit about some of those factors that shape 
why we haven't been able to reach eradication and how some of yeah. those um, lessons might be applied to thinking about um, during global um, COVID vaccine rollout. Right. Yeah. And I guess you're thinking about the Sabin vaccine, which succeeded the uh, Salk vaccine, the uh, Sabin sugar cube one. Um, and uh, but yeah, in, in terms of in terms of the, the dilemmas today, um, uh, there are still a few pockets of uh, of polio um, in uh, uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, and then also I, th I think still in, in parts of in parts of Nigeria. So it's really uh, it's just a, f a few a few places, and uh, uh, and um, other scholars ask this question as well: is what creates vaccine hesitancy um, and uh, unwillingness to to have this for uh, for Afghanistan and also for Pakistan there is a very particular connection uh, to uh, uh, some US actions um, there there was uh, an element of subterfuge there were some um, some US agents who who tried to gather information in Pakistan under the pretense of uh, vaccination programs. So uh, that's not to say that that accounts for all the suspicion of uh, vaccinations, but it does contribute to it in some ways. There are also uh, people who discern um, a, 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 uh, a conflict between vaccines and, and their religious beliefs. Um, this is uh, this is now true of some traditional Muslim communities, but but in earlier times it was true also of, of Hindus. And so, actually, in in India, uh, uh, in the in the 20th century, um, there was uh, there were challenges around that that ultimately were were overcome. And so, the the success with smallpox shows us um, just just how how engagement can work but also the remarkable persistence that is required, especially when you're encountering people from, from, different, from different societies who have very good reasons to suspect the motivations of international agents or Western agents of various kinds who are coming in saying, hey, this is the right thing for you. And never mind that, that these programs had an element of deception a few years ago. Now we want you to get this vaccine. It's a very delicate balance to strike. And I think that, um, it's been recognized now that that giving uh, public health programs a black eye like that was not productive. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mitchell. And I mean, Robert, you mentioned uh, in your talk a little bit around perhaps the shift in the ways in which we stigmatize as we consider a kind of uh, post-vaccine um, world around COVID. I'm curious, just in terms of a little bit of devil's advocate, during, is there a role for shame and stigma in a, in a healthy public health response? Yeah, I've, I've actually heard that uh, because, uh, you know, we're, we're doing uh, research on this right now. It's Nova Scotia COVID stigma dot, uh, dot CA study. So, you, so we've asked people to come in and share their experiences and we interview some. And uh, there was one individual um, who, who wrote in and heard, heard about the study on the news and said, uh, you know, hey, um, you know, what else are you upset about? Like seat sales and airlines? Like, well, that's a little testy. Um, but uh, he, he said, uh, we need the stigma, we need to shame people to to behave. And I said, you couldn't be further away from the truth on this. Because what stigma is, is when uh, groups of people uh, based on race, based on social perception, could be age, could be location, race, uh, occupation, whatever it is, it's when somebody assumes that you as being within their assumption is going to misbehave and deviate. It means nothing about what uh, people are actually doing. And when uh, social media and real-time communities uh, get the pitchforks out and they say that these people are the enemy, nothing good can come from that. This is possibly one of the most harmful things that can happen uh, within any sort of public health measure within the very structure of society. Uh, it erodes trust uh, down to the core levels to the point where I've had principals here in Nova Scotia contact me and say, we've had a kid who's, uh, who's had a COVID experience in the family, we've had to do lockdown and they sent the mobile health unit up to do rapid testing in front of the school. Uh, you know, what do we do now? We need to make sure that people aren't uh, feeling so blamed for this that they're, you know, that, that they're having a real emotional distress. So, you know, the, what I said back to, to this, this one fellow is I said, you know, here in Atlantic Canada, you could have a 25 year old woman who appears to be of Asian descent, who's driving a car with Michigan plates and is following health standards better than most. 
And yet, if you're predisposed to attack or blame this person, then you know the problem's with you. You know, you've got to you, you've got to really think about what it means to build communities and resiliency here. And uh, in that way, uh, you know, I think we're, we're we're stronger to recognize that. At the same time, there there have been people who have deliberately made an intention of flouting public health uh, uh, advice or to be uh, you know, spreading absolute nonsense through social media or other forums. Uh, we've actually had health workers here in Nova Scotia, some chiropractors uh, and physical therapists who were doing exactly that, who were saying uh, very erroneous and harmful things about COVID. They were found, they were disciplined for, for their actions. Now that's more to it. Uh, but the idea about trying to broad stroke any member of society at any point, uh, if it's in a pandemic or if it's any other day of the week, that's never good for anyone. And so I'm mean, thinking, uh, I mean, I agree with you on, on so many levels in terms of that. Um, but I'm, I mean, one of the things that I think we're often really good at as academics and researchers are identifying the issues and identifying the problems. We mm -hmm. struggle, I think, sometimes to really think about doing what are the potential solutions. And mm -hmm. So I'm curious, do you have some reflections on doing, what are the ways that we can interrupt um, do you know what I mean? Stigma and, and shame within society. What kind of levels of interventions are possible and feasible in that regard? Right. So this is actually what the whole purpose of the research project is about. And I have a real nifty graph that, that isn't ready yet. So I, I can't show you, but maybe one day I will. And it's basically a scale that, that kind of looks at how societies have tried to respond from this, either by, you know, completely rejecting public health advice to really tight surveillance, like, and not just, you know, uh, floating drones, but like social community surveillance and where some places have done better than others. And there is a bit of a pattern. There's a few patterns that are, that are showing up. But the thing is with it is how public health and how public education are perceiving their COVID experience. I think that the, the initial errors that were made here in the Atlantic bubble was to assume that we could close two bridges in Quebec, a border with Maine, and then we got it. And, and it's, no, that's not how it works. What works is when people have support and structure to follow health protocol and not risk the financial ruin or risk, right? And, uh, you know, I, I, as I say, it's, uh, there, there are people in certain, certain socioeconomic, racial, and gender categories that make it phenomenally more difficult to follow these health protocols. Other people, I mean, I'm, I, I live here in rural Nova Scotia and there's all sorts of new neighbors who have popped in from Manhattan, right? Because uh, that's what's going on now. Uh, you, they, the, you know, people are coming here and, and hiding it from the pandemic. Not everyone has the ability to do that. And for global health policy to think forward about the next pandemic playbook, what needs to really happen is a big rethink between not just, well, really defining health for its core, I should say, uh, not just seeing it as about a race against an illness or eradication of a virus, but to look at the health of people first. So if quarantine measures are gonna be put in place, uh, they need to be sensitive and appreciative for the local social, economic, and upstream social determinant health needs of that place. There have been some impressive surprises throughout this pandemic. Uh, one of them, of course, was in the, um, the one of the largest um, slums in India, in Mumbai, where the experts said, no, this virus is gonna rip this place apart. And uh, it didn't. Uh, there was community-based participation in health prevention and, uh, and health promotion and disease prevention programs. Similarly, countries like Ghana, countries in Western Africa who had experiences with Ebola, uh, out came the playbooks they went for it. Um, you know, some diplomats actually said uh, they were worried because they're they're following the playbook to the T. Case counts were low, but the playbook had been assisted through USAID and the CDC. So they're like, uh, "You guys have COVID really out of control there. What do we do?" And and someone said, "No, no, no. Trump's in office. Just just keep doing what you're doing. You'll, you'll be fine." And sure enough, the case counts have, have remained low because those plans did factor in what local conditions were needed to be. So if we can really just think about what is health and not just what is a virus, the next time something like this happens, and as you said, Mitchell, like the way our food systems are these days, there'll be another one, You, it's for sure. I mean, there's gonna be needing to be global changes coming up or we're gonna see a second pandemic in the 21st century. And just one last follow-up, Robert. I'm curious a little bit, um, 
sometimes we talk about you know taking balanced approaches that focus on your risks and strengths or your negatives and positives. And I'm curious a little bit about Jun, what's the opposite um, or the the counterbalance to stigma, and might there be some opportunities to think about interventions in that regard? Yeah, no, I'm glad you asked that. Um, this is something again that I'm working with um, uh, principals here in Nova Scotia, and I reached out to the new Minister of Education to talk about this. Is that you know stigma occurs because you're scared and you're you're scared and you're uh, you're couching that fear in 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 hatred or you're buying into other people's hatred and away it goes so the way to get through that is through compassion through cultures of compassion and that sounds really nice but it is really really hard to be successful when you are approaching policy through cultures of compassion. Uh, it requires work, it requires effort, it requires sensitivity. Uh, school level, right now, if say a student was to be uh, self-isolated for 14 days, what could their peers do to help them out? Um, and we're working on a three-stage approach right now to say, you know, you're, you're still with us, so to make sure there's constant connection with your class, with your peers, with your friends, through Zoom and whatever else uh, goes along, um, then, you know, bring some gifts, bring some food, bring some Irish soda bread because it's St. Patrick's Day uh, to, to make them feel, you know, good. And then have a task, have a group job that reminds people that they're still, they're, you know, just because they're in self-isolation, they are still part of the team. They, we, we need them, right? And it, it's not a disciplinary measure. And unfortunately, self-isolation is a disciplinary measure that Michel Foucault talks about going way back in the penal system. And it happens to intersect with public health policy. So Building that culture of compassion is tough. Uh, they've been working on it in, in New Zealand and some other, other jurisdictions to try to, to get through it, but that's the way we do it. We, we recognize it's not just a virus, it's we gotta take care of each other. Thanks, Robert. Okay, and Jifa, I'm, uh, I know you talked a little bit about this, but I just want to kind of uh, put it out there. I guess on the flip side, I think you, you talked a lot about during communities that are disproportionately affected in negative ways um, during through racism as a social process, but who benefits from scientific racism um, and how has that played out in COVID-19? So good question. I think, um, I don't know who benefits. I know the, the systems that were set up or the institutions that were set up to sort of uphold these ideologies benefit from it. Ultimately, we all suffer, right, from, um, um, from situations where we uh, are placing blames on people instead of looking at the contextual factors that drive um, these issues. So um, I can't point hands or fingers at who specifically will benefit from this, but I do know what I would say is that I, th I think as a society, as people, we need to start looking more beyond the superficial um, things that we see and addressing the core values uh, that is of shared humanity, shared trust, and willingness to hold one another's hands through this. I think that uh, a lot of communities, whether it be folks who are, you know, Black communities or whatnot, have felt a sense of socially being socially distant for many, many, many uh, years and we've all just gone through and we're still going through this uh, notion of social distancing and see how detrimental it is to our physical health, our mental health and have you not. So um, if anything, I hope that COVID-19 is teaching us some of the hard lessons that a lot of these marginalized communities have lived with for centuries and that we need to find ways to build communities. We need to find ways to reach one, out to one another. We need to find ways to speak up for one another that when we see something wrong in a community in society, um, it may be that person problem today, but if we don't take an action, it's gonna be our problem tomorrow. So that's what I would offer me. Yeah, thanks Chief. I mean, connecting kind of Robert's points near the end there and that piece, it, may, it reminds me of a conversation I had early in the epidemic with um, some officials from the Public Health Agency of Canada, shall not be named, but, um, and they asked us to stop talking about social distancing. And they said, can you please talk about physical distancing? Because all we're asking people to do is stay physically separate, um, which I think really speaks to this emphasis of focusing on the biological viral transmission and really during de-emphasizing the social process factors that during realistically um, are during what we're, um, during we're taking away from people and also during what are leading to some of um, the inequities that we were seeing. Um, and Jifa, just I guess one last question uh, for me 
during thinking about the research systems during broadly, whether we think about during funding systems or training, um, during I mean, award systems, um, during tenure and promotion, during we're kind of here in this university context, do you, uh, might you offer some suggestions around to how we could restructure some of these systems coming out of COVID to try and work against and prevent scientific racism? So thanks for that question. I've thought about this for some time and I think that one for the funding agencies, I am hopeful that they will start looking more into and wanting to understand the uh, contextual factors of people. So for example, NIH will ask for uh, researchers to uh, report race-based data, right? Which I think is fine, but beyond that, we want to, researchers need to understand or explain why is it that whatever it is that you are studying seems to fall around race, you know, skin color or whatever it might be uh, uh, groups. Uh, so for example, uh, in my own research and looking like heart failure, for example, um, you know, it was widely reported that black Americans, this was in the States, black Americans had worse 30-day uh, hospital readmission. And in my own research, I wasn't able to collaborate that finding. And so I kept thinking to myself, what is it that, what is it about my research that has led it to be different? Um, and that I don't see this sort of racial disparities that people have been talking about. And I literally told myself, I bet you it's the discrimination that people feel or experience when they're accessing health that might be part of the um, at play here. And government officials don't ask us to report those things, right? So uh, I would hope that uh, funding agencies will start funding uh, research into trying to even finding out how do you measure racism within the health context, for example. We don't know that, but we do know that it impacts your biology and every aspect of your body. Um, so that's one thing I think from um, just societal um, perspective, also just we need to really, uh, it's all of us to uh, jobs to try and push this notion that we are more similar than we are different. And uh, work that we do uh, ought to be highlighting that and not the differences. And I think every time I read a paper or see something, it focuses much more on quote unquote, the superficial uh, differences than you know, you know, when we're talking about income, we all have to have income. So how do we make it so that I can see myself in somebody else's problem and they can see themselves in my problem? So I think that is a huge um, undertaking, but it starts with us in the academic world um, to start presenting our evidence in a way that uh, allow uh, the average, you know, person who's not in the, uh, in the academic world to be able to identify and say, you know what, this is an issue, we need to address it. Uh, instead of putting it on those people, um, <laughs> on those people who, 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 whose problem it is to solve, so. Yeah, thanks Chief. I know um, with some colleagues working in uh, Indigenous and Two-Spirit Health have been talking a lot about during, when we show differences between Indigenous and white populations or predominantly white populations, we're really not making scientific advances. And we've known that for a long time and during continuing to write papers and reports that tell us the same things aren't really helpful. Um, and so one suggestion they've had around changing the needle on that is to say, if we're interested in improving Indigenous health, let's just talk to only Indigenous people to use um, during their own um, during population as the control so that we, um, uh, so I think I cut out there for a little bit, but just to say during, uh, the idea is really to focus instead of doing comparisons between during these groups to really focus on one group and look within that group at what are those other factors that are driving um, the actual experiences of health. And so um, it is a shift, I think, in terms of how we often think about population health work uh, in my own field. So I, it, I think there's some really rich conversations to be had there for sure. Okay, so um, that takes us to half past. We've got about half an hour left for our session today. Um, thank you to the panelists for enduring my questions. I hope they weren't too, um, too difficult. Uh, and so now over to those of you who are with us, um, what questions do you folks have from the audience? Um, you can type these into the chat feature and, um, and then I will filter them to our panelists. 
Nate, as, as people's questions come in, can I just make a comment to what you're saying? Yeah, that I think it's great to be looking within groups of people, but also knowing that, you know, it, it, it would be good to also compare, not compare, uh, how do I want to put this? So, for example, let's say that I'm studying income, low income, right? The, the, the issues around low income, those issue, I don't know that they will be super different from low income of somebody else who's not black. Right. So how do we uh, study the issue across groups and also highlighting that it does exist across group versus between groups, if you know what I mean? Um, you know, food insecurity is not just my issue. It's all of our issues. So how do we show that to show uh, to uh, how do we present that, that it does not only exist within groups, but also across groups? <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Jupa. All right, first question from the director, Oliver. Do you want to come on to Zoom and ask? Oh, thank you very much, Nathan. Yeah, that was fabulous, and thank you so much for your you know, very different perspective. I have two very big questions, so maybe you're just as another, um, another incentive to reflect on the long-term impact of COVID. One is, you know, we, we talked for very good reasons a lot about the divisive um, effects of the crisis in terms of racial exclusion, um, racially mo motivated forms of, um, of depicting particular groups as being somehow responsible for this. But I'm wondering on the other hand, do you see that um, COVID has also taught us lessons in solidarity and in inclusion that people on the ground have built new communities that, uh, that maybe also spill over into the post pandemic era when you know some of those resources that have been built, you know, trying to reach out to people who need help, you know, to to do this in a more inclusive way could also be sustained. So I'm just wondering, on the one hand, the clearly the exclusion, uh, exclusion, the racism that has been produced, but also the community-based resources of of looking after the more vulnerable, you know, of reaching out to individuals and so forth. The other one, historically, Mitch, you know, probably you can help me here, but also. Um, you might see, you know, those of you working in health, um, I'm wondering if these fundamental challenges to public health in the past, uh, pandemics, they've often led to substantial reforms of the health system, right? How we look at health, how we develop governmental um, agencies and responses. I'm just wondering, you know, given also the global scale of the pandemic, uh, the the experience on the ground, how we you know, approach this um, from a communal, from government perspectives. Do you see that we will we might rethink health and health systems um, as in terms of services, how we um, how we in a way organize our modern contemporary healthcare systems? Do you think there will be lessons to be drawn, or will we just go back to where we were right before the pandemic and? Or what, are, what could be elements, right, that we, you know, looking back say, oh yeah, that was a real turning point in terms of public health provisions, how we think about public health, how we also collaborate uh, globally um, and so forth. I know these are big questions, but I'm just wondering any reflections on those. Yeah, any of the panelists do you folks want? Does anyone want to jump in first? Um, I, I guess I will just say that in terms of your first question, Oliver, in terms of how the systems that we've built and how we can po uh, possibly continue to use those systems uh, moving forward, um, you know, I, I really hope we can. You know, I think that we've, um, talking with nurses, those are the people I'm surrounded with most of the time, people in the health, uh, we, I think we're realizing that uh, you know, socially we can live with less, right? So we don't need all of that. So, you know, all of that sort of uh, masses and things that we accumulate, we realize that we can't actually live with less. And I think from a nursing specific perspective, uh, realizing that there are, um, we are sort of bonding together more closely and checking in on folks or if somebody is exposed, making sure that their children are taken care of, making sure that you deliver food to them, their grocery to them, that sort of things that I've sort of heard of and I'm hoping that that stays and that we continue to do that because, um, you know, 
in a weird way, I think the universe kind of tells us, you know, throw things to us to remind us of ways to continue to be kind and, and connected to one another. So that's one system that I know that exists and hopefully will continue to exist and not just, you know, fizzle out because we don't have a pandemic. And maybe just to add to this, there's some talk about reinvesting into um, the healthcare systems, right? You know, and also giving, you know, we, we've applauded those frontline workers, but not really compensated them often properly, right? You know, these kind of, you, know, you see this across at least the Western world that I follow a bit more closely. We have in England, you know, also the NHS, you know, so what do we do with it, right? How do we um, prepare for those future challenges? So there might be also some real material implications for the healthcare systems. Yeah, you know what, I really hope so. I really hope so because I think a lot of the nurses are really burnt out. Um, a lot of the nurses, um, not just here in, you know, in the North in America, but across are, you know, they're exposed and then they're home, they don't have income, how you pay for your bills and all of those sort of stuff. Um, so I, I really think that hopefully this will give um, governments and different countries creative ways of trying to support those front workers and not just nurses, but other essential workers of, uh, you know, they talk about whatever, what is it, the universal income uh, initiative uh, and all of those things. So hopefully this is sort of the impetus to start that dialogue. Sorry, Robert, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 no. Your, your points are fantastic and uh, didn't want to take away from that. Um, I think, I think there is going to be a lot of changes that will come out of this pandemic permanently and there's i know especially in universities we're thinking oh we'll go back to the good old days <laughs> no uh, there's going to be a lot of changes and th the question is will 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 compassion drive it and i hope that it will because what we've seen is how very shall we say arduous uh structures of governance uh be it senates at universities or governments themselves have quickly and quickly made such uh, profound accommodations to get people through the pandemic. And a lot of these accommodations, if it's, if it's working from home, uh, if it's uh, you know, special accessibility needs, these accommodations aren't just, we're created. There's actually been a long history of groups, uh, people in disabilities, for example, who have advocated for this type of experience on, on a needs basis. And often many of them have found that it's been, it's been just oppressively hard to achieve that change. And there's usually a bureaucratic reason put in place as to why said change can occur. But the universities themselves should be examples of just how quickly these changes took place, uh, you know, to make those accommodations. And I feel that going forward, uh, when there are important accommodations that are being asked for, the, the reminder will be, well, you did it during COVID, so let's keep going. And I imagine we're going to see more of that. The COVID accountability. Uh, so uh, so um, uh, Oliver, I, I guess just to, to speak more to your, to your, to your second issue, um, uh, two questions for me come to mind uh, with respect to how we move forward with health and with care for infectious diseases. One is uh, the question of whether or not um, we're able to learn from international models or, or models from elsewhere, wherever they come from. Uh, I think that um, particularly in the United States and perhaps to, a, to an extent in Canada as well, it's been just incredibly sobering um, to see the utter breakdown in um, being able to look after people uh, and, to, and to, uh, to see how the health outcomes re related to COVID have been uh, really just, just so terrible. So will that mean that, um, that Western countries in general can learn from places like Ghana or even in some instances Sierra Leone for that matter, places that we are accustomed to, to uh, condescending to, frankly? Can we learn from those places? And th the United States in particular, um, <laughs> having spent a long time there myself uh, uh, previously, uh, there's a resistance to looking at international models and learning from others. And, and will, will the pandemic you know, uh, perhaps reverse that for the good? Uh, and then a second question, I have uh, is uh, with respect to um, particularly the, the products related to healthcare uh, ar ar around vaccines. Um, I've been fascinated by how 
by how there's been uh, not a lot of discussion about how vaccine production uh, has 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 been uh, uh, essentially performed from start to finish uh, within the private sector, obviously with uh, various government incentives and supports from from various ways. Um, but then we see that uh, we have um, we have an emerging sort of uh, diversity of vaccines with the with the kind of you know patchiness in 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 that 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 engenders uh, globally and then. Um, so, so the question I have is, can there be more creativity and resourcefulness for a more coordinated approach to this kind of problem? It has to do with, with money and uh, uh, production capacity, but then it also has to do with, with international collaboration, with standards. Um, so this gets into very quickly, you know, global governance and, and what, what um, North Americans are accustomed to thinking of as a marketplace. And understandably, there's great resistance to that. But when you have something that is of such such elemental importance as a vaccine, uh, it's very important to get it right. And so, so I think that there are these motivations for really fundamental change, um, but uh, it, it remains to be seen whether, you know, we can, uh, we're going to, we're going to waste this crisis. You know, there's that, that, that uh, statement with, I think others have heard that never let a good crisis go to waste. And I think that we, first we have to get through the worst of the crisis, and then we have to look around and see if we're going to have it go to waste or not. Thank you very much, guys. All right, any other audience members have questions or comments they'd like to share? You can type it into the chat. You can put your hand up. All right, while we wait and see if there's anyone else, I'm curious, um, I think, uh, Mitchell, it was you who brought up this piece around the uh, opioid epidemic and the COVID epidemic. Do you notice these kind of co-occurring current uh, epidemics and do you know, at least strongly in our local jurisdiction of, um, of here in BC? I, my history and work is largely related to the HIV epidemic as well. And um, I mean, there is quite a few examples of these in, um, in our living memory, uh, if that makes sense. And I am curious a little bit around, uh, I mean, how much we continue to see your kind of last comment there around um, not wasting a, a crisis. I mean, how much we continue to learn the same things. Uh, and we know that basic things like housing and food security, um, do you know what I mean? Uh, violence prevention, doing you know, our things that shape, um, shape these kinds of health outcomes and shape these pandemics. And yet we still see during even in a wealthy country like Canada, uh, those basic determinants not met for um, groups systematically. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, connecting a little bit of G4D, your kind of point around thinking about social process and, and some of the, the comments broadly around the panel. I'm just curious a little bit about how do we learn from this? Um, because there are quite different groups that are affected when I think about the HIV epidemic, when I think about the groups um, in terms of uh, the opioid crisis, and then when I think about COVID. Obviously some strong overlaps in those groups as well. Um, but it, Mitchell, you'd kind of spoken about this difference of like the Spanish influenza affecting younger populations versus COVID uh, in terms of advanced age populations. So um, any thoughts about doing how do we connect these and not talk about them as, um, I guess, isolated epidemics that have their own kind of unique learnings? Well, I, I'm curious to hear about the other panelists on this, but. Uh, I just say briefly that um, you know when you have something like a like a pandemic, it puts you into into crisis mode. But there's a th this is a kind of a familiar thing where th there there where healthcare is is reactive, and I think that a lot of the, uh, one of the challenges of look of uh, working on you know the ground level determinants is that um, some respects are more intangible, but they also require a, a more persistent uh, focus. Um, and so it's so it's very difficult uh, to to um, have a to you know adjust your time horizon and uh, and to to create a framework where you are uh, funding lots of different things sustainably and uh, making sure that you're ready for various things because just as you say it's impossible to forecast what the next what group the next crisis will hit uh, disproportionately so. Um, I would just say, you know, how do we how do we get out of crisis mode? And there are structural things that make that very hard to do. But I think that's perhaps one problem. And I'm interested. The the, the thing about crises is, is that, you know, they can reoccur a lot. And if your uh, readiness plan and your um, say we call it situational awareness remains the same, 
time after time after time for the same crisis, you're going to have the same outcomes um, that way. And few organizations are willing to do that. And really, I think it comes down to realizing, okay, what are the new factors? What have we learned uh, from, you know, from this whole experience? Why did some places do very, very well for keeping case numbers down? Why did others do horribly at it? Why were some ICUs uh, completely full? Why were others not? Anyway, all the questions that go with it. But the thing is, is that in this context, is you know if if you're if you're building your house in a tornado alley the same way every single time and not taking the readiness to go forward then that's that's very erroneous and i think what we're seeing with this is we can begin to understand how things like uh what elements of globalization made this pandemic so you know spread as quickly as it did where are the risks factors? And again, I come back to the, as Mitchell, as you said, come back to the food systems. I think that's a, that's a huge one that needs a rethink. I mean, there's a reason, um, th there's reasons for it we can get into. But the other factor too is to, is to realize what really needs to be done in a preventative sense to keep this from occurring again. And part of that is gonna be a very difficult conversation between public health experts, epidemiologists, political leaders, and military intelligence. Because the what we've learned is that there was all source point intelligence available on, on what was going on on this pandemic that could have possibly moved up precautions and vaccine development by two to three months. And when we look back on it after a year, what difference would those two to three months have made for especially the populations in the United States, Europe, and Canada? Um, the countries that did not act on the military intelligence that was provided to them after a, a, a J2 security meeting in the beginning of January, the ones that failed to act on that are the ones that got really hit hard. Uh, New Zealand acted on it. Australia acted on it. The other five eyes, not so much. And uh, I think that's another conversation. But again, that's all source intelligence, something epidemiologists aren't really great on, on wanting to include. Uh, and military intelligence aren't really comfortable declassifying sources sometimes. So these are going to be really, really hard conversations coming up if we're going to take the next pandemic preparedness seriously. Yes, I think a little bit about, I mean, the, the value of a crisis to public health to some extent is it's when they can exercise the most amount of power. Right, in terms of uh, being able to exercise public health orders and as we see in many jurisdictions. And a lot of that is balanced on public opinion in terms of during being able to, if we think of it sometimes as framed as compliance, for example. Um, and so there's this interesting dance uh, during when I watch the, um, when I look at during what's happened in the past year around public health waiting, I think for it to feel like there's enough public support and to not over flex um, for fear of during revolt. Um, and I think that aspect in terms of during, where, where does the leadership come into and how do we during, even educate society um, in terms of what we know, I think uh, are kind of great, uh, great questions that come out of that. I realized I had skipped over a comment that was in the chat from uh, Tamara. Would you like to come on and just share a little bit of the, the comment you had shared earlier? Sorry, I missed that. Oh, sure. Um, just, uh, I was having a chat um, with a young woman who was a student um, at UVic from America um, and from the States, and she had had her car vandalized. And I think that people here in Victoria have probably heard that story. And she was really challenged with whether she stayed or not. She would go to national parks and she'd have her UVic um, uh, student ID. So she was living here. So she, you know, but just the hate that was towards her. And she finally um, ended up being able to change her license tag and that stopped. And, you know, and I think that here in Victoria, we have a lot of um, people who came up from the States who work at the army bases, a lot of students. Um, and just, so I just wanted to reflect on, on that um, in that it affects so many different people in different ways. Yes, I think of it, I mean, one of the things that I've, I've thought a little bit about is, I mean, the invitation to be a righteous citizen, um, do you know what I mean, carrying out the goodwill of the state. Um, I think there's an interesting piece there that, that there's, um, 
I think there's some pride and some, uh, I mean, Robert, I know you kind of framed this and, and Chief and others as do no one wins from this, but I do think there are short-term gains for some people who feel like they're really doing the right thing for the greater good um, or for greater society. Uh, and I'm just curious a little bit uh, how people react to that. Yeah, it's, you know, yeah, I've, I've seen it here in, in Nova Scotia very clearly. I mean, um, I, I my, myself personally, I was in, I got across the border from the States into to Canada about eight minutes before it, it shut. And uh, right away, you know, I was cruising around with the vehicle with uh, US plates. It was, you're looking over your shoulder and there was this one time in the summer, a couple of guys in a brewery in Mahone Bay. I won't get into that, but the the thing is, is um, you know, as much as the one person in the grocery store who's sitting there and making sure that you don't squeeze the avocados and you are walking the right way down the the aisle, uh, is probably feeling exactly that that bursting civic pride. I'm doing my my best and, and beyond, but at the same time, when you have something that borders on vigilantism. Uh, you're really creating some bigger challenges ethically about, uh, you know, what is really the role of, 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 you know, citizen officers in this, in this way. Um, you know, the thing is that the state for, for all of its, its critiques uh, understands how to engage uh, citizenry. And sometimes citizens don't know how to engage each other in a way that, that maintains respect and courtesy. And, as much as you know, um, it may be the easy thing to do to to fear people into a certain type of behavior. The type of behavior that you can build through respect, courtesy, and compassion is always going to be stronger. It's one that uh, you know I've actually seen here with this research in Nova Scotia that it has evolved. I mean, what was a sort of stigma and the car vandalisms and the, and the reports from people who appear to be of Asian descent in the fall, they disappeared by September. And then it was on to students who said, why are people yelling at us when we're lining up for a COVID test? You know, and, and then that went away. And there seems to be sort of a dialogue to say, oh yeah, we, mm, that wasn't cool. We got to behave better. And the closer that you can get to one where it's a continuous message of support and, and respect, that is how you beat these viruses with ancient methods like we're using. Okay, well, we've got a few questions now in the chat. So, um, uh, Mehdi, do you want to come on and ask your question? Sure, thank you so much. Um, I don't know um, how relevant my question is, but as we were talking about this sort of othering uh, that is happening, uh, during the COVID pandemic, um, I was thinking about um, how this has been um, a sort of um, a common practice in a way for uh, towards certain communities. For example, we have had this sort of othering against different groups, different communities, but post 9-11 probably and a little bit before that, we had this kind of othering against Muslim communities probably. Uh, my reflection and my question is, do you think this sort of, the new forms of othering that emerged uh, during this COVID pandemic era, do you think is going to impact us to re rethink uh, um, the concept? Are we going to have a better understanding? I know this is a really broad question, but um, now we see that regardless of your uh, religion or necessarily uh, skin color, there are other lines that um, those otherings could happen and, and do you think uh, we could learn from that in the future? Thank you. Thank you. Over to the panelists. Any thoughts? You're right. That is a, a very broad question, and I, I was thinking about, you know, even the notion around are you vaccinated versus are you not vaccinated. You know, that's going to be another uh, quote unquote othering that would happen. Um, I think that I, I know. I don't know. I think that you know um, there are going to be. Um, 
you know, different challenges that are coming, even something around, you know, if somebody chooses to continue to work from home versus coming into the office when we go back to the university, for example, is that going to present a situation where people are going to, you know, over time start re resenting one another for those things? Or uh, if a mother chooses to keep their child at home instead of getting them back into school and that sort of stuff. So, you know, I think there are going to be other new category of othering that's going to be coming uh, uh, up and um, you know the challenge is going to be how do we address that and how do um, we ensure that you know people don't feel stigmatized but good question I'm, I'm going to have to do a little bit more thinking about that okay um, and one last question I think uh, Rob I see you've come onto the screen and the microphone so please would you like to share your comments and questions I think my question is uh, quite closely related. In the literature on cooperative societies and so on, there's discussion of the way in which um, cooperators, um, cooperation can be promoted by punishing um, those who defect or dissenters or those who are non-cooperative. And uh, Robert made this very interesting point that, uh, that stigma is associated with the shaming of people on the basis of their membership or their appearance or that they're, they're belonging to particular identified groups. Um, and that stigma seems pretty much universally uh, to be condemned. But the shaming of behavior, the shaming of individual behavior, um, just as you were saying a little bit earlier, that uh, could, be, could be constructive and helpful in, in various ways. I don't know if the panel has a comment on that. Yeah, no, it's something that's uh, that, like the theme about this, about is there is there a role for a little bit of stigma here and there, a bit of shaming here and there is something that's coming up in, in the research. And it's something that I've been trying to answer with with really historical examples. And, you know, we're, we're kind of in a, in a space where before COVID, the, the advocacy for being kind to each other and compassion is really resonating around mental health awareness and promotion. And even to the point where coaching strategies are changing on, on sports teams. Um, you know, the, the, the good old, I know that sea shanties were, are, were popular for some reason during the pandemic, and, but, but I don't think that's connected to a fondness for like naval discipline, you know, and, and like shaming and flogging and, and, and that sort of thing from the old days. There's a reason we've moved away from that. And really as much as it, you know, the, the ways of doing it in old kept that order, kept those rules in force through that. I would like to think that there are examples coming out of this at both community level, uh, provincial level, state level even, and then at country level where we've seen this ability for compassion and the resources to be compassion to be more effective, um, it, you know, to to discourage behavior that can be uh, erroneous to public health to promote COVID. Um, you know, there uh, here in Halifax for sure. If you were that person sort of skedaddling down the down the street after hours, uh, there were some eyes coming out of windows. And who is that? But if you've got the ability to stay home. Uh, and the resources to do it, that's more effective. The, the frontline workers, the essential workers, the nurses, the truck drivers who didn't have that choice and who are now returning to their homes in like Ecom Seacom and like Chester, uh, you know, rural, rural places where everybody knows everybody. It's now gotten to the point where because your mom's a nurse, your dad's a truck driver, you as a kid, you're no longer welcome on the playground. And, and that's something that uh, I think we can do better at because the the ability to take care of each other through times of crisis, uh, you know, without the military discipline, uh, is something we can probably achieve. Sorry, Nate. I just want to quickly add um, back to the earlier question and also to this that you know, I, I it escaped me in the sense that um, I'm a nurse and I remember the beginning when things were coming, you know. Um, an accountant calling me that I can't come in and I'm like, but I'm not working as frontline right now. It's like, oh, okay. I thought you were in the hospital because we want to protect our patient, you know, our, our clientele and all of that stuff. So 
you know, that sort of stuff. So I think there's this notion that we all have to be careful about, right? Shaming uh, behavior versus shaming people. When you feel like your core has been shamed, uh, that does not, uh, you don't go away uh, feeling good about that versus, oh, you know, Jifa, you currently working in the hospital because if you are, this is a new protocol that we have in place, um, you know, abide by that. I think, you know, that feels a little differently than just, you know, because you're a nurse or your mother's a nurse or whatever, you're not allowed in this place. Uh, feels very different. Okay, thank you, everyone. I think we're going to wrap up there. I just my kind of final reflection on that uh, piece of conversation is um, you're really thinking about the fact that the same behavior done by different people to different people will be perceived differently. And I think the historical context um, is important in that as well. So thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us today. Especially thank you to Robert Mitchell and Jifa for your presentations um, and taking the time to talk with us all. Um, I hope you all keep well. Um, and as Bonnie Henry says, uh, be kind to each other. <laughs>